Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. And my co-host is Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, welcome back to the Libertarian Angle. It's always great to be here with you and our viewers. Yeah, it's kind of a sad subject that we're going to be dealing with, but an important one today, and that's the, the Dallas shootings that took place. As everyone knows, uh, you've got this guy, Micah Johnson, who opened fire on Dallas cops, uh, killing five of them, injuring seven of them, and uh, the cops in turn turned around and killed him. And of course, he was acting in response to two killings of, of, of blacks that had occurred in, in other states uh, that, that looked like just wanton killings on the part of the cops. And so he was angry over that, motivated by that, and decided to open fire on the cops. I want to put things in a larger perspective first, Richard. You know, I, I, I really think that there's a there's much more going on here than just the standard arguments of you know racism and and of course gun control. That's going to be a standard uh, response of the status. And you know, it, we're living in a very dysfunctional society. I mean, I don't I don't think anybody can really deny that. There's a lot of bizarre things that are taking place in America. Uh, the things that you would not ordinarily expect in a, in a normally healthy, functional society. Uh, for example, we don't see any of this type of thing in Switzerland, uh, but we see it here. We see the mass murders. We see the, the, the acts of terrorism. We see, we see what, what, are, what, are, what seem to be just unexplained acts of violence where people go into a movie theater and just start shooting people up. And I, I think there's a real cause of this, and I want to bring up a theme that that I brought up in the past that I know people don't like to hear, but it just it needs to be said because I really think it's the root cause of, of most of the dysfunctionality in society. In a larger sense, I think it's the statism that afflicts society. That, that when you've got a, a society in which government is tightening the screws ever more on people's freedom and liberty, that that's going to have reverberation. It's going to have negative effects. But more specifically, I want to talk about this whole talk about this thing in the context of these wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan that have been waged for I don't know 25 years or now, where the government's been killing people constantly on a daily basis, and and you know it was always thought that this militarism would not affect America, that that the desk over there of countless people, you know millions of people maybe. Um, wouldn't have an effect over here that the mainstream media wouldn't show the body parts of all the drone assassinations and the bombings and the killings and that Americans could just keep doing their little lives and normal going to their sporting events and going on vacation and that the national security state could do its thing and the American people could do their thing and that it wouldn't have any effect. Well, I think that's impossible as I've long argued that that constant death machine is going to seep into the subconscious of the American people and it's going to set people off the the wackos who ordinarily would get along in life sort of strange unusual but they don't go off and start doing these these bizarre things and I, I and even in a, in a more fundamental sense has been the militarization of American society uh, you see this at sporting events, for example, where people are asked to raise the, their caps and praise the troops, and we're supposed to thank the troops for all of the death and destruction they're wreaking overseas because they're doing it for our, our, our own good. And that militarization, that mindset has really seeped into American society, and I think you see a lot of it in the police department. And you see a lot of it in, in, in the black community, too, where, where it's perceived that the cops in general are waging war against blacks. And so, and then the cops are looking at it like, oh, well, you know, we have to consider this as a wartime situation also. Um, for example, this guy that, that committed these killings in Dallas, he doesn't go in exact revenge on the cops that killed those two blacks in other states. I mean, that would be somewhat rational if you're going to exact revenge, go after the person that did the killings. No, he goes and kills just cops in Dallas who had nothing to do with those killings. Because for him, he's got this mindset of this militarist mindset, this is war, it's the cops against blacks. And the interesting part of this, too, also is that he's an, an Afghanistan war veteran. I mean, they taught this guy 
all these things of war tactics and 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 uh, how to assassinate and I think there was something called cover and ambush or something where he was going from position to position. I mean, this is like the perverse outcome of the national security state. One of their own people that they trained then turns his gun on the Dallas police. But by the same token, Richard, the, the cops look at this as war. And I'm specifically referring to how they killed this guy. I mean, in my opinion, they murdered the guy. Now, he may have killed these cops, but that doesn't warrant murdering him. That's not the way a criminal justice system operates. A criminal justice system is you bring the guy to justice. You don't know what he's going to say in his trial. Maybe he's temporarily insane. Uh, you just don't know what's going to happen in a trial. But our criminal justice system has always been based on the idea that if somebody commits a crime, even if it's a heinous crime, killing cops, that you do everything you can to bring that man to justice. Here, they had the guy trapped. They had him surrounded. And there, he was posing no threat to anyone. Uh, if he had come out shooting and the cops' lives were in danger, sure, then okay, they can fire in self-defense. But here they sent in a robot bomb. Now, where'd they get that idea? Obviously from the military. I mean, this is Obama's whole principle of assassinating without due process. Look how many people Obama's forces have killed in the Middle East with no due process, no trial by jury. Uh, it's, it's just, we know they're guilty and we can go kill them with bombs or whatever. And it was, it's interesting, I read that a statistic that five of the cops that were killed by this guy were veterans themselves. So, and I, my bet is that if you did a poll of the Dallas Police Department, a large percentage of them would be military veterans. So they have this militarist mindset rather than a mindset of a criminal justice official. They say, oh, this is war. We've got to kill this guy. And so they send in this robot bomb that really just, in my opinion, just murders the guy. When they could have just sat him out, the guy was going to need food and water at some point. But that traditionally has been the role of the police. Is you wait a guy out, you put him under siege, you negotiate with him, and you do everything you can to bring him back. Because life is sacred. Even the life of an accused murderer is sacred. You bring him, if you go through the criminal justice system, if they have a death penalty, they have a death penalty. But that's the way criminal justice is supposed to work. It's not supposed to work like the army. So my opinion is, is that there's something much bigger here. Now, you know, we can later get into things like anti-discrimination laws that I think also are impacting this. But let me throw it back at you now because this is the context that I put in it. The increasing militarization of America uh, in, in many, many aspects of life. Well, I, I, I in general agree with you. Um, what, what struck me um, when I started hearing the accounts that who this fellow was, uh, where his training had been. I understand that he, per se, did not necessarily see combat. He wasn't with a, a narrowly combat unit in Afghanistan. But obviously, as you point out, he had the military training uh, to do this sort of duck and cover, this, this, this sniper routine where he, he shoot down, obviously with extremely good marksmanship, to down five to kill them and then seriously injure seven more. Um, so he had gone through this military training. What struck me when I heard this is uh, the, the argument that had, has been made now for the last couple of years that it was dangerous to, try, to not prevent recruits who wanted to join the Islamic State from entering Iraq or Syria. Because if they were allowed to go there and become part of the Islamic State movement, they would receive military training uh, in firearms, uh, uh, bombings uh, of various types. And having gone through that military training, they might very well come back to Western Europe, uh, Central Europe, uh, the United States, and having gone through that militarized training, have the more professional wherewithal to undertake uh, de deadly actions. Now, if you are concerned about a person joining a foreign uh, uh, military force and going through military training, 
that prepares them for this type of action against either armed resistance or civilians. Why should you not similarly be concerned when you are recruiting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young American men predominantly, but also women now because of the combat permissibility, into a rigorous mindset of order and discipline where the mission takes precedence over everything else, where the human life of the members of the team are secondary to the achievement of the goal, and that you draw this narrow distinction between them versus us. There, are, there is no Miranda rights on a battlefield. There is no notion of, of, of being concerned with, with wounding rather than killing. They are the enemy in the most plural and collectivist sense with little difference anymore in, in the warfare of the last hundred years of distinguishing between civilian and armed combatant opposition. Now, why should you not be surprised that if such people who have gone through such training in the U.S. military in such large numbers and are sent into war zones, most recently in Afghanistan and Iraq, in which they're put into a position of viewing all others on the other side of this very fluid line as the enemy who are trying to kill you because they view you in that collective sense, you must view them back in the same way. And then with all of the psychological effects of combat that, that is often emphasized when a person returns from military service, give that person that training and that experience and that mindset of collectivist identity, the enemy and the friend, and then put them into this setting here, why should you be surprised if there are a small minority of such people who become psychologically dysfunctional, influenced by the ideologies and the politics that they hear and read on the news, in the news, on social media, on these websites, and now get sucked into a new environment of them versus us. This tragic young man, who is a murderer, as you correctly said, he didn't go after inappropriately in a vigilante sense, against the actual people accused of killing those two unfortunate blacks, respectively in Louisiana and, and Minnesota, but no, just policemen who were identified not as the Muslim fanatic enemy in Afghanistan, but as the white policemen here, and proceed to just shoot them in this collective sense. Why should you be surprised that some of your people come back and have these delusions and perverse and dangerous trainings and mindsets when you're fearful of what oh, Europeans or Americans being recruited and coming back from Islamic State training with that same type of framework and mindset and, and, and preparation. So I totally agree. Now, if you take that and then overlay or make it complementary, let me suggest, Jacob, with the politics of the United States at home, a politics that has turned its back increasingly on the idea and the ideal of individualism. Where we may speak different languages in terms of our ancestors or if we're a new immigrant, that our languages and our religions may have differences about them, our cultures, our, our, our cuisines. But that in America, the ideal was that there was a melting pot. And we all came, at, came out of that melting pot as Americans defined as someone who had rights to their life, liberty, and its honestly acquired property, who is not to be tarred and feathered and pigeonholed and categorized by the accidents of birth. What nation did your ancestors come from? Are you white? Are you black? Are you Hispanic? Are you Asian? Uh, are, are you poor? Are you rich? And so on. Now, there might have been private prejudice. There might be private discrimination. But in principle, however, it was not always practiced. The law of the land was not to judge you on that basis. And the culture of American individualism was that however much individuals might act and view others in prejudicial and discriminatory collectivist group ways, the principle was that that was un-American. That was the benchmark against which all of our conduct, however imperfectly and inconsistently, was to be judged and evaluated and treated as a human being. That has been broken down. That has been broken down. 
was always issues of, of white and black because of the tragedy that in America, compared to other parts of the world historically, slavery was marked by the pigmentation of a person's skin as it developed in the colonial and then the, the, the pre-Civil War period in the United States. And that has remained a legacy. And it is difficult for people to get over that. And it has its residues up to the present. But that was against the ideal, however imperfectly personified in the character and the conduct of real human beings here. That has been undermined even as an ideal to attempt to, 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 to approach. Why? Because you are no longer an individual who has the accident of this aspect of birth or some other. No, you are an African-American. You are an Asian-American. You are a Latin, Hispanic American. You're a native Indian American. That determines your identity, your sense of entitlement, the way the government and others are expected to treat you through affirmative action and implicit and explicit quotas, and your, and your, and your eligibility and your privilege from the state. All of this works on people's minds and breaks down the escape from the old world sense of collective tribalism and returns it to an America that was founded on eliminating that as an ideal. To use a phrase from Martin Luther King, judging a person by the, the content of their character, not this irrelevant thing of a pigmentation of skin. He combined the things that he talked about with, and I think I complimented at the beginning, and then this tribalism of collectivist politics. You mix all this together, and is it surprising that these events are occurring? I think not. Yeah, uh, your, your point, first of all, about the, um, about the soldiers coming back a little whacked out is a good one. I, and I don't, I've never bought that it's just this post-traumatic stress disorder, though, the stresses of combat. Uh, I've always described the, the reason that a lot of these people come back all screwed up in the head is guilt is that you know they they invade iraq a country that never attacked the united states and they're ordered to kill people and they do kill people and i don't see for for a sociopath that's not going to have much of an impact a person without a conscience but for the ordinary guy or woman uh that has a conscience goes to church going out killing people that have not done anything to you or to your country uh, how can that not eat away at you like an acid? And I would venture to say, despite the fact that, that Al Qaeda was based or in, in Afghanistan, that 99% of the people they've killed there, especially in those wedding parties, had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. How can this not affect a person? How can it not screw them up in terms of, of conscience and, and right and wrong? And so a lot of these guys come back. We've seen it, the alcoholism, the drug addiction, the violence, the irrationality. They get off kilter. And so, you know, how can it be surprising when, when we see this, these weird dysfunctional acts that take place, especially of violence? Um, and then your, your other point is, is well taken, too. You know, when I grew up, Richard, down in Laredo, Texas, I, I grew up with this ideal that, you, you know, your, your ideal is not to judge people on the basis of their skin color. That It's a, it's a colorblind society. I remember, I remember being taught that, that, hey, it's irrelevant. And that really, to me, is the ideal, where skin color is sort of an irrelevant thing. But they've made it so that it is relevant. You have to consider a person's skin color before you decide whether you give them a job or not. Because if you don't, you may be violating some yeah. uh, civil rights uh, affirmative action law or something. So Absolutely. they encourage this type of thing. But let me bring up a couple of more things here. Because I, I think they're really, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and blacks in general have a point that, that police departments seem to be populated by bigots. Now, that's not to say that every cop's a bigot. It's to say that there are a lot of bigots in the, in the police departments. And I, I think I have an explanation for this. But first of all, before getting to that, the drug war. Blacks have a vested interest in ending this drug war, Richard, because this provides the ex a ready excuse for bigoted cops to do their thing to blacks. It's all legal to stop them and search for marijuana and harass them and abuse them and subject them to pat-down searches. And Blacks need to rise up and finally demand an end to this war on drugs because 
for one thing, it's it's totally immoral. It's so so destructive. It's a horrible infringement on liberty, but it provides the bigoted cop with the excuse. Now, that's not to say that they won't use broken tail lights or any other little silly excuse, but you would take an enormous part of the excuses to stop blacks on the street and on the highways and stuff if you end this this evil and immoral war once and for all. But many years ago, you and I addressed, when, when you were vice president of FFF in the early days of FFF, we d addressed, I think it was probably our second year or so, anti-discrimination laws, where we endorsed the repeal of, of uh, mandatory integration laws, and of course, a post-segregation at the same time. But we call for the right of people to be able to discriminate. The idea being that that's what freedom of association is. You get to choose who you're going to associate with. And you, if you don't want to associate with blacks, that's your right. If blacks don't want to associate with whites, that's your right. But in that kind of society, people are exercising freedom of choice. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're deciding these things in their own way. And a bigot is going to be doing his thing in a bigoted sense. He's going to have a restaurant that serves only white people. Or he's going, he's going to have a store that sells only to you know this group of people. And the same sort of thing like we have private clubs today that the private country clubs that discriminate against blacks legally or Jews or whatever. But my opinion is all that would have worked out. There would have been boycotts against businesses that that were discriminating against blacks, sort of like the same boycott that was against South Africa that brought down apartheid. But it wouldn't have been this huge thing. People would have just, it, it would have it would have worked its way out, but at least the bigot would have had an outlet. And I think you have the bigot's got a right to be a bigot. He, he, he has this emotional need to discriminate. By clamping all that down and eliminating the, the, the right to discriminate, I think what's happened is that a lot of these bigots have found a way to do their bigotry. And that's moving into police departments. I mean, what, what more natural way? I mean, here you can, you can do your thing, your psychological disorder thing against blacks by chasing them after for drug violations, broken taillights. You can shoot them indiscriminately. You can hide the evidence. Nobody's going to say anything until recently. So, so I, I think that, that that clamping down of freedom in society was supposed to bring us this nirvana of, of uh, racist-free life. Well, that was never going to happen. You cannot eliminate what exists in the heart of an individual. You can leave them free to do this in the private sector where they bear the economic consequences of their decision, like for, for reduced um, uh, income share, uh, market share. But by clamping it down and tightening the screws on society, I think you've only made the situation significantly worse. Yeah, uh, well, let me sort of uh, amplify that, and I'd like to make a, an additional point. Um, Anti-discrimination laws of the 1960s, uh, the part of the Civil Rights Act during the LG, LBJ administration, uh, was, was meant directly to uh, eliminate what was seen as discriminatory behavior, uh, not just in the old South with the segregation laws, but against blacks in general. Now, there were groups that were discriminated against, often significantly, before those laws were passed, who were not black. And the two groups that I'm thinking of most particularly were Asians, Japanese and Chinese, uh, and Jews. Now, uh, in fact, the first uh, immigration restriction laws introduced in the United States was in the 1880s. I know you, you know this, Jacob, maybe some of the viewers don't. Came in in the 1880s against the migration of Chinese and Japanese into the United States mm -hmm. for various and sundry reasons, part economic competition, but the, the highlight of the idea of this would be a bad influence, certainly a mixing of the races. Uh, then a large segment of Jews came to the United States. Uh, there had always been Jews in America. In fact, I'm living in Charleston, Carolina now, South Carolina. And in fact, Charleston had, uh, it, during the colonial era and during part of the United States over the years, the largest Jewish community in, in, in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact was, is that when a large wave of uh, Eastern European Jews came to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, to escape from anti-Semitism, uh, discriminatory laws against them, uh, not only, but uh, particularly at that time uh, in Imperial Russia, 
if I can bring a personal note here, my mother's family is Jewish. And uh, on my mother's side, my, my, my grandmother and my grandfather uh, were Lithuanian and Russian Jews. And uh, particularly my grandmother's family, when she was a very little girl, came here in the first decade of the 20th century precisely to escape from pogroms. The Cossacks, with, gov with government condoning, would come into the rural villages uh, in Ukraine at various times, instigated by priests and government officials, and proceed to kill people and destroy property. Why? Because they were the Jews who killed Jesus. And, but when they came here, they faced discrimination. For instance, my grandfather, my mother's father, came here as a small boy, went to school, spoke English perfectly. He wanted to be a medical doctor. But there were unofficial quotas against accepting Jews into medical schools. We don't want too many of them. He ended up, therefore, having to go to pharmacy school. Notice he could go to pharmacy school and end up having his own drugstore in New York, right? He wasn't stuck in a little village by a government edict, right? He had that degree of freedom. Maybe not all of his dreams, but he could fulfill a dream in a free America, even though there was this private university discrimination with some medical schools. Now, there were no anti-discrimination laws protecting Jews at this time. There were no anti-discrimination laws protecting Asians at this time. They overcame these discriminations because of changes in the society itself and their own attitudes of, in spite of the prejudices and the bigotry of others, I will find the avenues in the society to succeed and have a life for myself and to hopefully believe that my children can have it better. So this is a case. Anti-discrimination laws did not have to overcome those prejudices, even though these pre prejudices clearly were from the American individualist ideal, inappropriate from a cultural point of view. They didn't get locked into these situations that the anti-discrimination laws combined with the welfare state has created this underworld of poverty and enclaves still within our major cities. Now, the other element or aspect of this, again, if I can just continue with this, Jacob, is a point that you raised earlier in your comments. And that was this idea of how this man was killed. I've thought about that too, but I have for a long time. In the military, in spite of laws, in effect, uh, international agreements, the fact is there's an acceptance of a greater degree of indiscriminate bombing and shooting that, yes, it's tragic and unfortunate that innocent civilians uh, as collateral damage may get in the way. But the task must be to get the enemy whom you are targeting. And if there are a few innocent bystanders, well, that's war. Right? That's part of the psychology. Now, in the, in, in the civilian world, in the United States, that has been different. Suppose that some criminal, a robber, or even someone who's killed someone is being chased by the police, and he runs into a building and takes hostages. What is the first reaction that the police is supposed to take compared to the military? In the military, if some enemies have, have run into a building, you call in the Air Force or the artillery, and it's bombed. And if some civilians get ki killed, that's war. Civilians, you call in the negotiator, right? The hostage negotiator. You try to talk him out of it. You try to have him not do anything to those he's holding. You try to talk him out. You try to starve him out. You try to make a bargain where you don't let him get away, but try to get some of the hostages out so that if something goes wrong, you're minimizing the loss of innocent lives. And in principle, you want to take him alive, even if you know on a video camera he killed the, the, the convenience store guy, and it's clear that there's no ifs, ands, or but about it. You attempt to take him alive, because even he has a right to his day in court. And even though you're going to show the video that you've already looked at, he's presumed to be innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. That has changed. The droning has changed the psychology. The militarization of SWAT teams and other elements of the police forces around our country, their, their disrespect for private property, property to asset forfeiture laws, where we are viewed as 
as as as as as as as as as a sheep to be plundered, to shaved off with the wool of our wealth through through through, through these asset forfeiture laws. This has worked on my psychology of how police forces work. And as you said, this man's death is an example of that. Now, he had given these warnings, he, he had bombs planted in this, in this building. You have to be concerned about that, no doubt. But truly, they've had these types of standoffs before, where these threats have been made. Oh, I planted bombs, the building is going to come down, I'll take you with it. They faced these situations before, what, this is the first time in American police history? You talk them down, you starve them out, you do it, you, you try to get a sniper. Of course, now the idea is the sniper does a headshot. I think in the, the, the more appropriate thing is to try to wound the guy rather than kill him, unless there's an eminent threat to a civilian's life or the police officers themselves. I think that's consistent with what you yourself said earlier. That has changed. Today, it is a militarized society in which there is no, even at home, this idea between civilian and, and perpetrator enemy. No, there are no innocent bystanders because there's no sense of rights for the innocent and the accused anymore. That is what is weakening at home the senses of justice and rule of law and making all of these circumstances, the policeman stopping someone for a broken taillight or a nut who's been trained by the military shooting down on, on, on unarmed civilians and police and then being taken out with, with a robot bomb. This is a radical change in the culture of how our society is policed, and it's not for the better. No, it's 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 for the worse. And and to reinforce what you're saying, you know, in war, you've got a, a company commander that says, okay, I can am I can go and attack that building in a frontal attack, which is going to cost me about five of my soldiers because the guy's going to fire back, or I can just come and call an airstrike in and blow up the whole building along with. 10 other people. And he inevitably takes the position, I'm not going to sacrifice my men. Uh, I'm going to have that bomb dropped, even though I know it's going to kill five other people. I mean, that's their mindset. Yeah. And we've, we've seen it time again. And it, I find it interesting that the police said, we didn't want to risk any of our men. I mean, that's, that's the military mindset. I mean, yeah. if, you know, if you don't want to risk your life, don't join the cops. I mean, don't join the police force. I mean, that's a necessary part of being a policeman. But there was no real risk here involved. Your, your point about the bomb, I mean, that really couldn't have been a big factor in this because if they blow up a bomb, that can set off a bomb that has been laid there. And, oh and not only that, but if the guy sees the robot coming with the bomb, he can, he can set off the bomb. Oh. So it was really, Richard, a military mindset, in my opinion, that said, this guy just killed five cops, and we're not going to jack around with this. We're going to just take him out. Right. And uh, the other point that I wanted to address that you alluded to when you were talking about um, your grandmother and the discrimination against Jews on a private basis and how they come uh, overcome that, uh, you alluded to the fact of, of, of where the society today has been so oppressive and in terms of the black community. And this is what a lot of blacks don't realize. And we have addressed it in, in libertarianism. Minimum wage laws that lock out of the labor market, the people at the bottom of the economic ladder. There's a, there's a chronic unemployment rate among blacks, of, of black teenagers in the inner cities of like 30 to 40 percent. And yet you still see blacks supporting minimum wage laws. It's so frustrating because they can't see what's going on here. And I saw a great op-ed today by Michelle Alexander, who's written some great stuff on the drug war. Uh, the New Color, The New Jim Crow is the name of her book, where she alludes to the notion that that guy that they choked in New York was selling cigarettes on the black market. Or, or another guy was, was doing something, I forget what it was, one of these black victims uh, selling something on the black market. But it, and she says, look, they killed him for these minor little things. Well, but that's what goes on in society where you have this tightly controlled regulatory system yeah. where you have a licensure system that only the rich can get uh, licenses to cut people's hair, to shine people's shoes and so forth. 
uh, or be doctors or lawyers. I mean, it's, it's this whole regulatory system that really benefits the big guys, the rich guys. And, uh, and, and then the welfare state that, of course, puts people in the dole for their entire lives, giving them a sense of hopelessness and despair. And it's really time for people in the, in the black community to discover libertarianism. Because really, Richard, what we're talking about here is that libertarian principles, if applied consistently, really are the key to getting out of this deep morass in which America finds itself, this morass of dysfunctionality and violence. I agree with you completely. On that note, we'll wrap it up. Uh, a, a deeply sad situation in, in Dallas, all over the United States, uh, somewhat pathetic, but with a glimmer of light because there's a way out of this, and that's with libertarianism. Right. On that note, we'll wrap things up. Uh, Richard, enjoy the, the visit with you again, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Until next week, thank you for viewing.